Oh. All right, we're going to take you Toronto over to Ottawa now. Let's listen in to Melanie Jolie, our Foreign Affairs Minister. More united than ever before. This morning, the G7 foreign ministers met. We were joined by your, our Ukrainian counterpart. Inspired by the courage and resolve of the Ukrainian people, we are working together to suffocate the Russian regime. We are working in locksteps. Measures that were described as a last resort just days ago are now moving forward with consensus. The Russian regime is being hit from all angles with severe costs for their unjustified and unprovoked attack of Ukraine. They will feel the impacts of their actions financially and politically immediately and for years to come. The Russian regime and those who have enabled this crisis are increasingly isolated. Soon, there will be nowhere left for them to hide. En plus de sa tentative de soumettre la libre volonté d'une nation souveraine en envahissant l'Ukraine, Putin's attempt to subjugate the free will of a sovereign nation by invading Ukraine, he has sought to sow division and discord among the alliance. This was a grave miscalculation. We are united, more united than ever before. Measures that were described as a last resort just days ago are now moving forward with consensus. The Russian regime will feel these financial questions consequences, and they will feel this for years to come. The Russian regime and those who have enabled this crisis are increasingly isolated, and soon there will be nowhere for them left to hide. Allies are working together to equip Ukraine with the tools they need to continue the fight. We hear their call for more help, and we're doing our part. This week, the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine asked me directly for more equipment to keep their fighters safe. They need helmets, body armor, gas mask, and night vision gear. I assured her Canada would deliver, and I meant it. Today, we are announcing that Canada will send an additional $25 million worth of this protective equipment to Ukraine. And let me be clear, we will send more. To ensure this equipment makes it to Ukraine as soon as possible, I've also worked with my Polish counterpart to secure transportation routes to their border to Ukraine. Together with my colleague, Minister of Defense and specialist in times of procurement, we will make sure it gets there. Cette semaine, this week, the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine asked me directly for more equipment to keep their fighters safe. They need helmets, body armor, gas masks, and night vision gear. I assured her Canada would deliver, and I meant it. Today, we are announcing that Canada will send an additional $25 million worth of this protective equipment to Ukraine. And let me be clear, we will send more. To ensure this equipment makes it to Ukraine as soon as possible, I have also worked with my Polish counterpart to secure transportation routes to their border to Ukraine. Together with my colleague, Minister of Defense, we will make sure it gets there. I'd like to finish by addressing Canadians who have family and friends in Russia. Please tell them what is happening in Ukraine. Send them pictures, videos of what you and we are all seeing through our own media and social media. The Russian regime has a very powerful propaganda machine. And that machine is selling falsehoods and lies about their motivation and invasion of Ukraine. The Russian people do not deserve to be at war with their neighbors, family, and friends in Ukraine. We all deserve to live in peace, and this madness needs to end. Thank you. Uh, merci, Melanie.
Thank you, Melanie, and good afternoon, everyone. Since the illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014 and the occupation of eastern Ukraine by Putin, we've been on the ground to help Ukraine defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity through a multifaceted and comprehensive approach, including by reinforcing NATO's eastern flank. And today I am here to provide you with a brief update on our response to these new unacceptable action, actions undertaken by Putin in order to support our Ukrainian friends in the most important fight of their lives. Minister Resnikov and the Ukrainian people for their strong resistance against Putin's naked aggression. In light of Ukraine's evolving needs and our commitment to continue to support Ukraine in coordination with allies and partners, we have now authorized the provision of an additional $25 million worth of non-lethal aid to our friends in Ukraine. As La Ministra Jolie uh, did, this aid includes helmets, body armor, night vision goggles, and gas masks. This aid was requested by Ukraine, and we are working as quickly as possible to get it there as Ukraine continues its fight to exist. We have also approved today additional airlift support facilitated by the Canadian Armed Forces. The first aircraft will depart for Europe tomorrow, and the intent is for it to be used by NATO and in support of the delivery of this aid. This assistance builds on the ongoing work of our Canadian Armed Forces and the Communication Security Establishment. This support is multifaceted and is as follows. First, our CAF is working with the Communication Securities Establishment to provide Ukraine with expert in cybersecurity, including cyber threat intelligence, to help Ukraine defend its networks against cyber attacks that are increasingly forming part of modern day warfare. I want to reassure Canadians that we do have the tools to keep Canadians and Canada's own cyber environment secure, and that I will remain in close contract with the chief of the CSE, Shelley Bruce. Second, we must remember that our Canadian Armed Forces have helped to prepare more than 33,000 Ukrainian soldiers for the very circumstances that we are witnessing now through our training mission in Ukraine. And to those asking whether Canada will send troops to fight in Ukraine, a combat mission is not on the table at this time, nor is it on the table for our allies, including the United States. In fact, I had again a productive call on Thursday with my American counterpart, Secretary Austin. The buildup of troops in Europe is to enhance the deterrence on which the NATO alliance is built. We are always conscious that Article 5 of the Washington Treaty is the golden rule that an attack on one is an attack on all. As we have previously stated, our CAF personnel previously in Ukraine are in Poland and safe and are now preparing to ensure that we are ready to support with humanitarian efforts when required. Third, the over $7 million worth of lethal aid for Ukraine has also now been delivered in full and in time to be effective. And lastly, we are reinforcing our support for NATO's eastern flank by expanding Operation Reassurance, which will further deter Russian aggression and main stability in the region. I spoke this morning with the ministers of defense of Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia and France, all of whom expressed their strong appreciation of Canada's ongoing efforts to reinforce NATO's eastern flank and the alliance's deterrence efforts more broadly. There also remains across all branches of the service, 3,400 CAF personnel who are ready to be deployed to the NATO response force if called upon. The world has undoubtedly become a more dangerous place. While these dangers can sometimes seem far away to Canadians, our insularity is eroding as geopolitical fractures caused by the likes of so chaos and uncertainty. 
Through these tumultuous times, we must unite as a country and redouble efforts to support our allies and trusted international partners. Je vais rester en contact. I will remain in close contact with our partners and allies, including Minister Reznikov, with whom I continue to speak each and every day. I will also remain in close contact with our Chief of Defence Staff and Chief of the CSE as this horrific, unconscionable situation unfolds to ensure that we are doing our part to help Ukraine defend its nation. Despite the horrendous and cruel nature of Putin's war, it is heartwarming to see our allies standing in unison in defense of democracy. Now is the time to come together with an unwavering unity of purpose. To come together with an unwavering unity of purpose. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Miigwech. Thank you, ministers. We will now uh, turn to questions. Um, so as I said, we have 20 minutes. Just a reminder to uh, try to mute yourself between your question and your follow-up. Uh, we will start with uh, Rafi Boudjikanyan. Thank you very much. Perhaps the first question can be for Minister Arnaud. You mentioned keeping Canadians safe from cyber attacks. Uh, what reassurances can you offer given Russia's announcement this morning of its uh, nuclear deterrent being uh, put into place, I guess? Okay, hi, Rafi. Let me take that question in two parts. First, let me address the second part of your question relating to nuclear. I would like to take this opportunity to denounce the bellicose and irresponsible rhetoric of Mr. Putin. Canada stands united with allies in the face of his naked aggression. And the rhetoric relating to nuclear capability that we heard this morning is highly irresponsible and we denounce it wholeheartedly. In terms of your question relating to cyber attacks and the threat posed to Canada, I would like to indicate that since 2019, we have had in place the authorities legislatively to allow the communication security establishment with the tools it needs to protect Canada and Canadians. Let's be clear that cyber attacks are part of the Russian playbook and bolstering our cyber security and safeguarding our critical infrastructure is critical. It is top of mind and it is the main priority that I discuss with our chief of the CSE, Shelley Bruce, most recently on February 24th. The CSE will share valuable cyber threat information with Canadian critical infrastructure partners, and it has on numerous occasions issued warnings to Canadian organizations and businesses for them to take all precautions relating to uh, cyber attacks and cyber security threats. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. And Minister Jolie, if I can ask you, you were talking about the propaganda machine uh, that Russia uses. So what are the challenges for Canada in banning the network Russia today from Canadian airwaves, as uh, Minister Rodriguez has suggested he would like to do? Well, there's... Uh, so I'll take also your question in two parts. So the first one is... Um, Obviously, we know that right now, Russian people are under a lot of uh, mis under a very important disinformation, misinformation campaign. And therefore, we need as a country, but also the entire West to be able to send images, send information about what's going on in Ukraine to Russia in Russian. And so it is important for Canadians uh, to be able to talk to their friends and families to, that would be in Russia to make sure that they understand what's going on. 
this is one of the first time in her history that a very important war is happening on social media and on Facebook. And bit by bit, there are protests happening in Russia because people are understanding what is going on due to a, a bit of information they're gathering. We need to make sure that that flow of information is even more bolstered. And so that's why I call on Canadians. On the question of disinformation here at home and in the West and RT, definitely we want to make sure that RT uh, be taken care of. That's exactly why, again, this morning I had a conversation with the Minister of Heritage, Pablo Rodriguez, and I know he's working on this as we speak. And we all agree that RT is a problem and that we uh, will solve it. Uh, but I think that it is a question of RT on our broadcasting side, which Pablo Rodriguez is taking care of, but it's also RT and Sputnik and all the other misinformation, disinformation campaigns that are going on made by the Russian regime online. And that obviously uh, we're, we're looking at uh, making sure that our social media companies do more to prevent uh, any form of disinformation by these websites and by these different entities uh, through their own networks. Milan Kret, La Presse. Bonjour, Madame Joly. Good afternoon, Minister Joly. How do you perceive the negotiations, negotiations that are supposed to happen between Russia and the Ukraine? Answer, I'll be frank, I agree with diplomacy. I think it's a good thing. I think that uh, dialogue is a good thing too, but the problem right now and uh, what concerns me is that there is an, a great difference between what Russia has said over past weeks and what how it has acted. And that gap is so big that I am very concerned about uh, the fact that there is no ceasefire and there is no has been no troop pullback at the borders of Ukraine. So I have shared my concerns this morning with my colleagues from the G7 and with uh, my Ukrainian counterpart who was uh, also there this morning. So uh, we'll, uh, let's see, but uh, I would like to say that I'm extremely concerned and uh, in the meantime I would like to commend all the efforts of Ukrainians to defend their country. Question, have you discussed the fact that there are certain Ukrainian cities that are completely surrounded by Russian troops? I imagine that is a problem with supply lines of medication and so forth. Answer, yes, we're seeking to be able to continue to supply Ukrainians with uh, essential goods, and that is why I am in contact with a number of people within the Ukrainian government every single day, and that is why it was so important to speak with Poland, because one of the main routes, of course, is the one that goes uh, through Poland. But I've also been in touch with my uh, other counterparts from uh, surrounding countries, Romania, Slovakia, Moldova, because obviously they also have entry points into and out of Ukraine. Now, sometimes it is more difficult than through Poland, but they are still uh, possible entry points. Thank you. Libertium, Canadian Press. Yes, thank you. Uh, this question is for uh, Minister Jolie. Uh, earlier today on uh, at least one of the political uh, television shows, you described uh, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin as, um, I believe, uh, irrational. I'm wondering if that was just a slip of the tongue or if you actually and you and the government believe that. And if that if you do believe that, if that is the case, how do you negotiate with somebody like that? And how worried should Canadians be about a nuclear war? Well, nobody that uh, decides to bombard a sovereign nation such as Ukraine can be rational in doing so. So we all agree that there is a level of irrationality to what is happening in the decision making that President Putin is doing. And while doing so, he's not only isolating his nation, but also will affect the, his 
very own people because there is clearly a, um, a, a very strong push on the part of, uh, of the UK, the EU, the United States and us, and more and more countries around the world to, t to send a very clear message to, to Putin. So uh, like I mentioned in French, Lee, I'm very preoccupied with how Russia has not only decided to, um, I'm very preoccupied with the fact that there's been a delta, a difference between what Russia has said over the past weeks and how they've acted. And so in that sense, any form of diplomatic talks is preoccupying me right, right now. And I'm not the only one in the world because clearly the trust in the Russian regime is, is, is pretty much at zero at this point. So I mentioned that to my uh, Ukrainian counterpart. Uh, I was not the only one to, uh, to be preoccupied by that. Um, but at the same time, uh, we need to continue to deliver uh, goods and, and aid, uh, may it be lethal or non-lethal to Ukrainians as they're under siege and as they're fighting for their freedom. And my follow-up is to Minister Anand. Um, you know, with this talk about uh, Russian nuclear forces being put at a state of high readiness, NORAD officials have been warning for years about the need for NORAD modernization. The head of NORAD in December uh, during a visit to Ottawa said he was awaiting political direction from both you and the Secretary of Defense in the United States uh, on a political framework. Can you provide an update on where we're at with NORAD modernization? Has that political direction been given? So thanks for the question. Uh, I am going to say that the NORAD modernization piece is extremely important to me and to our government. And in particular, we are going to continue to make critical major investments in personnel, equipment, and infrastructure that will support continental defense and enhance our capabilities to respond to emerging security challenges, including in Canada's North. I have had a number of conversations with my counterpart, Secretary of Defense Austin, about NORAD modernization. And these include making significant investments to the North warning system them. In fact, we recently awarded a $592 million contract to Inuit-owned Nasituk Corporation for the operation and maintenance of the North Warning System. The bottom line is that we will remain firm and unwavering in defending Canada's sovereignty, the peoples and communities of the North, and our national interests, and NORAD modernization is a central aspect of this prioritization. Thank you. Mike Drolet, the Global. Thank you very much. Um, clearly, Ukraine, Ukraine is in need of munitions and gear. And as you've announced, uh, Canada is now sending $25 million worth of gear. Um, Russia, for obvious reasons, I would imagine, would not want that gear to arrive in Ukraine as it won't want any guns or ammunition to come from any other country, uh, countries. I know that you're flying it in, not into directly into Ukraine and going over the border, but now that you've announced it and Russia knows it's coming, do you not suppose that Russia will do everything they can not to allow it to get into the hands of the Ukrainians? Uh, thank you, Mike. Anita and I won't speculate as to what are the intentions of Russia. But what we can tell you both is that it is important for Canada to step up and to help. Um, and not only that, I would say, uh, we're not the only ones in, in the world doing so. Today, the EU announced that they would be providing lethal aid, and that's their first time in their own history. And so in that sense... Um, we want to make sure that we look at all options possible to deliver lethal aid. Yes, we're, 
working with Poland, but we're having many conversations with many countries to make sure that the delivery is possible. Go ahead, Anita. Okay, thanks. Um, first of all, let's be clear, only Putin knows what Putin will do. And we will work as hard as we can to deliver this aid as quickly and as prudently as possible. We were successful in delivering our first package and our second package of lethal aid on the ground in Ukraine. And we have the logistics expertise and the relationships with our allies to ensure uh, that we are secure when we are delivering our aid. So I will say that this particular package today, which is $25 million of uh, non-lethal aid, uh, is going to, in the first instance, be transported to Europe uh, via a uh, Hercules uh, and the Canadian Armed Forces will be assisting. And we will continue to make sure that we are taking all precautions so that our aid reaches Ukraine safely and securely and gets into the hands of the people that need it. Thank you. Thank you. And my follow up question is about uh, Belarus, which has been home to um, some Russian armaments, and they've been launching rockets into Ukraine from Belarus. And there's been reports that Belarus is now getting ready to uh, enter this fight and enter the war. Does that change anything um, for Canada and for uh, Canada's allies in terms of how, uh, in terms of the response towards this uh, this conflict? If I may, uh, we know that Belarus has been. Uh, facilitating uh, Russian troops through their borders for uh, some time. And, and we know that the Belarus regime has been an issue. That's why this summer we sanctioned President Yukachenko directly. And that's why this week on Friday, we announced 50 more sanctions against Belarus. And we will continue to put maximum pressure on Belarus. This is clearly, clearly a um, priority for us, but not only us, I would say the entire uh, G7 and the alliance, because we know that uh, Belarus and the Russian regimes are working hand in hand against Ukraine right now. And so in that sense, uh, we will continue to uh, impose maximum pressure on Belarus as we're doing with uh, against Russia as well. Stephen Chase, Globe and Mail. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. My question is for Minister Anon. And the question is, the first question is, the um, Ukrainian government, Mr. Zelensky, has called on foreigners to join the fight against Russia in Ukraine. They're going to be forming a foreign legion of volunteers and uh, the British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss said she would support uh, Brighton's going abroad, Britain's going abroad to help uh, this fight. So I have the same question for you, um, Minister Anand. Uh, would you support Canadians joining this Ukrainian Foreign Legion to fight Russia? Um, would you counsel them against it? What would your position be on that? I will uh, respond initially and then ask my colleague Melanie if she would like to add anything. Uh, but we have advised Canadians not to travel to Ukraine for security reasons. We understand this is a fight for Ukraine's motherland and we understand the desire uh, to go. But our responsibility as a government is to indicate the security risks with undertaking travel to Ukraine. We are doing our part to support while keeping Canadians and Canadian Armed Forces personnel safe. Mel? Thanks, Anita. Um, well, obviously, a couple of things. We've said to uh, people in Ukraine since February 1st to leave Ukraine. We've also said uh, to people in Canada not to go to Ukraine because of security reasons. That has been our travel advisory for now some time. 
At the same time, we understand that uh, people of Ukrainian descent uh, want to, uh, to to support their uh, fellow uh, Ukrainians and, and also uh, that there's a desire to uh, defend the motherland. In that sense, it's their own individual uh, decisions. But let me be clear, we are all very supportive of any form of uh, uh, of of support of uh, to to Ukrainians right now. That's why today we're announcing non-lethal aid, body armor, night gear, uh, very important equipment, and that's why also we need to do more. And we know that we will be doing more in the coming days. Okay, it sounds like you're saying it's up to them if they want to travel over there. Um, and my second question is regarding just clarifying the prospects for, and this is for uh, obviously Minister Anand, but obviously I would like to hear from uh, Minister Jolie if she wants to respond as well. Just want to clarify the prospect for more weapons to Ukraine. Are you uh, shutting the door to more weapons for Ukraine, including, for instance, uh, anti-tank weapons, or are you preparing or looking for opportunities to send more weapons to Ukraine. Okay, uh, thanks, Steve. Let's start off by saying here that at this time, any support we can give to Ukraine is helpful to their military. And we continue to assess daily what we can provide to the Ukrainian people, as Melanie just said. Your question related to additional lethal aid and I do support a multifaceted approach to the examination of what aid will be provided. And indeed, Minister Resnikov and I have on a number of occasions discussed uh, the types of aid that would be useful for the Ukrainian army. Additional lethal aid is not off the table. We are working with our allies at the current time to determine who can provide what and how fast. And as those discussions ensue, we will have more clarity about what we can do from a Canadian perspective. Thank you. Mel? Thank you. Well, I just mentioned it in another question, Steve. Um, you saw today the U announced for the first time in their history the importance, the fact that they would be sending lethal aid uh, as a group, um, and so we're doing that. That uh, they've done that. Uh, we know that we've already sent lethal aid. There's been two shipments of lethal aid that uh, were sent successfully because of the great work of CAF members. And at the same time, uh, we know that we need to do more because Kyiv is under threat. Ukraine is clearly under siege. And that's why we will coordinate with allies uh, as we're looking at different options, like Anita just mentioned. Um, so it seems that we are, are all out of time. I was wondering, ministers, there's uh, two people that would like to ask questions. Uh, so I was thinking maybe uh, they could split a question and uh, the follow-up, if you have a few minutes more, um, that would be great. Do you agree? And so Ryan and uh, uh, Pelak could... No, actually, I think Ryan left. Oh, he's still there. Uh, so Ryan, maybe you can start, and then uh, uh, Pelak, you could get the, uh, the follow-up. Thank you, ministers. Yeah, um, this question is for Minister Jolie. You talked uh, in your opening statement about encouraging Canadians uh, with Russian family to send images uh, to Russia of what is really happening on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, you know, I'm wondering with some of your language, are, are you hoping to see more than just uh, Russian troops back in Russia, but also maybe some sort of political change or regime change in Russia as well? Thank you, Ryan, for your question. First and foremost, we need to put maximum pressure on the Russian regime. The entire G7 members can do so, and we are doing so politically, economically, and we're supporting Ukraine through different means, including lethal aid. But at the same time, it is important that people in Russia understand what is going on 
And also we're seeing protests happening in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in many cities across Russia. This is an incredible, um, it's, a, it's an incredible sign of courage by these own protesters, because we know that protesting in Russia is something that is um, condemned by the regime. In that sense, we want to see that Russians are aware that, that the protesters are protesting based on information facts and basically the true reality that is happening south of the border. That is also why it is important for Canada to have an ambassador in Russia. It is important for Canada to know what is going on on the ground and to hear what are the different movements of population that are happening in Russia. And so that would be my answer to your question. Lastly, Palak Mangat. Hi, Minister. Thanks for sticking around. Um, I just had a question for Minister Anand. You said that some equipment has already landed on Ukrainian soil to, quote, be effective. Um, can you just sort of explain how you can be assured that it is being effective, what the benchmark you're using to say that is? You know, is it merely that it's landed there as per your timelines or or that it was physically in the hands of Ukrainian people? And just moving forward, how do you measure its effectiveness um, or its impact, if not in helping with deterrence? Okay, thank you for the question. So we have trained approximately 33,000 Ukrainian soldiers since 2015. And in delivering both lethal and non-lethal aid. That aid was received uh, by the Canadian Armed Forces on the ground in Ukraine prior to the further invasion by Russia last Thursday. And the Canadian Armed Forces were able to hand over the aid to the Ukrainian soldiers and to assist them and explain to them what this aid was and would be used for. And so let's be clear that the work that we have done as a country and as the Canadian Armed Forces to build the relationships with the Ukrainian army has been fundamental to the transfer of both lethal and non-lethal aid. And what we have done is to extend Operation Unifier for another three years. And while that operation is suspended temporarily, we very much hope that it will continue so that we will be able to provide the Ukrainian army with the training uh, that we have been providing over the past seven years. So in direct answer to your question, how can I be sure? Because the Canadian Armed Forces who are on the ground in Ukraine told me that they had delivered that aid and it had been received. And I trust what they say to me. Thank you.